So it's 6.29, do you think it's too early to stop? Or? No, 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 no. You want to get out of here, right? Nah, hey, you know what? I'm just saying this for you, because my lectures tend to go long, so. Oh, okay. All right. So again, I'd like to thank you guys again so much for coming out. Um, again, you guys have been a great crowd. And, you know, normally it's difficult to get people to, you know, sort of go to these highfalutin theology things just once. And so you guys have been coming, you know, every week for the past four weeks. So I just want to say, you know, you guys have been a wonderful crowd and, you know, very receptive to all the stuff that I've been saying. Um, again, just to overview, as you all know, in these lectures, we've been uh, focusing on the O antiphons, you know, the antiphons being a particular type of hymn recited during the, uh, well, it can be recited in a variety of different liturgical services, uh, but, you know, we, we have to be focusing on ones from the Vespers services, and as you all know, the, uh, the O antiphons, also known as the Christmas antiphons, happen to be a series of antiphons that are recited in the Vesper service in the last eight days leading up to the Christmas Eve service. And again, these are significant because they take, they, they all focus on various titles, usually biblical titles, attributed to Christ. And in having entire songs focused just on these, you know, what it does is it takes a lot of the themes that are implicit in Advent and makes it more explicit. And again, you all know, you know, like the main purpose of these hymns. You know, some people out there, they go, why should I care about a very specific set of songs or, you know, uh, prayers that are used in the worship of the church? And again, like I said last week, you can't love what you don't know. And the entire purpose of the Christmas season is to commemorate and to meditate upon the first coming of Christ. But again, what Christ did historically 2,000 years ago is also representative of what happens in the life of every single believer. And so by meditating upon what happens 2,000 years ago, we are also preparing ourselves to accept Christ into our heart as individuals. And again, you can't accept Christ unless you first have some understanding of Christ. Um, you have to have a good understanding of who Christ is, and what his mission is, and how that impacts your life as an individual. So, if you look at all, and again, the reason why I've been focusing on the liturgy is precisely because the highest thing that we as humans can do is worship God. You know, if God is the source of all goodness, there is no good greater than God. And so, you know, there's nothing more important, there's nothing more fundamental to the human race than its relationship with God. And so the liturgy, and not just the Mass, but all of the formal public worship of the church, whether it be the liturgy of the hours, whether it be the Mass, any of the other sacraments, it's twofold. To teach the people and to glorify God. So, by way of review, what have we learned over the course of the past three weeks leading up to now? Well, based on these antiphons, we've learned that Christ is the divine wisdom incarnate. That he has within him all of the authority of God, which he uses to teach us the way of truth, to reveal the law to us, and to liberate us from sin. That since Jesus is God in human form, he is that bridge between God and creation, who opens up the gates of heaven. He is the divine light being shown upon the darkness of the human condition, thereby elevating it. And so now that that sort of provides the context, we can now get into the antiphons for this week, which are the last two of the seven, or rather the eight Christmas antiphons, the O Rex Gentium and the O Emmanuel. And the O Emmanuel is sort of like the culmination of all the other antiphons, because it sort of gets to the heart of what the Catholic and the, the, the Christian view of Christ is. But let's begin more specifically with the O Rex Gentium, which is Latin for O King of Nations. Now interestingly, um, 
for anyone interested, the O antiphons actually would have been sung between December 17th and December 24th, or December 23rd, rather. So actually, it was within this past week that they would have been sung. So if any of you had the opportunity to attend a Vespos service uh, over the course of the past week, you would have heard these particular antiphons sung. And the O ex gentium is actually the one that would have been sung in the Vespos service for last night. So, but again, as always, you know, let us begin by actually listening to the song itself. Because again, you know, these hymns are works of art. You know, they are very concise ways of learning theology, but they are also, you know, very beautiful as well. And so again, by listening to these songs, it moves us emotionally, and by analyzing them, it moves us intellectually. So again, like with always, Let's begin by actually listening to the antiphon itself. inspired it. Uh, but again, before I go into it, let me just repeat what I said in all my other lectures. What are the two rules of Catholic biblical interpretation? So number one, yes, context is everything. And number two is, yes, the centrality of Christ. So the biblical verse that I'd like to focus in on tonight is actually taken from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 2, verses 2 through 5. And the verse actually goes like this, and I quote, In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest mountain and raised above all the heavens. <coughs> all nations shall stream towards it. Many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the Lord's mountain to the house of God, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he might instruct us in his ways, and we may walk in his paths. For from Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and set terms for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. One nation shall not raise the sword against another, nor shall they ever trade for war again. House of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord." Unquote. So, what does this verse mean? So, just to get into a little bit of the, uh, the history of religions, many, it's oftentimes said that Judaism, what makes Judaism unique from the other Abrahamic religions is the fact that it's a very uh, tribal religion. When you look at the other two Abrahamic religions, Christianity and Islam, they tend to be multi-ethnic. Whereas in Judaism, there's only really one ethnic group that, you know, that, that tend to be the main practitioners of Judaism, and that is ethnic Jews. Now there are people who are not ethnic Jews who practice Judaism, but very often it's a very specific group of people, those people who are believed to be descended from the ancient people of Israel, 
uh, who lived in biblical times. And very often you will see people, you know, Indian Jews, Ethiopian Jews, you know, uh, you know, Middle East, Jews from various parts of the Middle East. But many of them, even though they don't look like what people in the West think of when they think of Jews, still have ways of trying to trace their culture back to the Jewish people or to <coughs> the ancient Israelites in some form. Um, so, for example, in, in Ethiopia, many of them claim that, you know, um, they are descended from one of the sons of King Solomon. King Solomon married um, an Ethiopian woman um, and the Queen of Sheba, as I said last week, and his son didn't like the way he was running the nation, so him and a group of about a thousand people from each of the twelve tribes all basically left Israel and resettled in Ethiopia. Uh, a lot of Indian Jews, many of them uh, settled there because of uh, Jews who settled there because of trading. Uh, there's also a group of Jews who much later got shipwrecked off the coast of India. So again, you know, it's, in many ways, Judaism reflects something about ancient cultures where each tribe had its own religion. And again, no one, like if someone says, if I say, what's your ethnicity? You don't say Catholic, or you don't say Christian. But very often, if you go up to a Jewish person and say, what's your ethnicity? They'll say Jewish. And if they are members of the Jewish religion, they'll say, oh, I'm Jewish. That's my religion. Or if a Jew converts to Catholicism, they'll say, oh, I'm a Jew, but I'm a Catholic. That doesn't make any sense. Like, if a Buddhist converts to Catholicism, they don't say, oh, I'm a Buddhist, I'm a Catholic. Or, you know, um, if you look at places like the Middle East and Africa, that's, those are the places that have the highest Muslim population. Oh, if, if, a, if a Muslim converts to Catholicism, they say I'm a Catholic, but I happen to be Syrian or Egyptian or whatever. But, and so the thing with the Jews is Jew was originally another term for the ethnic group, the, the culture. Most ancient religions didn't have names, you know? And so eventually the term Jew became adopted to the religion because it's like this is the religion of that group of people. So again, even though they don't claim relativism, like they don't claim, oh, this is true for us, but not for you, um, there's still a strong connection between the culture and the religion. But <coughs> over time, as the Old Testament progresses, the more universal elements of Judaism start to become more explicitly defined. Now, the term universal, or universalist, actually has a few different meanings when you're talking about philosophy and theology. And one of them, is, I'm, here I'm talking about cultural universalism. So the notion that there are certain spiritual or theological or moral norms that sort of transcend cultural boundaries. So, you know, as Judaism progresses in its history, so in the later Old Testament texts and the post-Old Testament, even though there's still a strong link being made between the culture and the religion, you know, because this notion of God forming a covenant with a specific group of people, and that's where the Jewish religion was born, you begin to see sort of, you know, the more universal elements being more strongly accentuated. So take, for example, Isaiah 44, uh, 9 to 11, which says, quote, Is there any God but me? There is no other rock, I know of none. Those who fashion idols are all nothing. Their precious works are of no avail. They are their witnesses. They see nothing, know nothing, and so they are put to shame. Who would fashion a god or cast an idol that is of no use? Look, all its company will be ashamed. They are artisans, mere human beings." Unquote. So God, speaking through the prophet Isaiah, is saying, you know, the idols worshipped by the pagans are just inanimate objects made by people, you know. But now, as Christians, we take that as, and you talk to Jews, Muslims, Christians, you know, of all varieties, they take this for granted. But that would have been a radical claim. And that would have been not only a radical claim compared to other people, like, oh, you know, like, the Assyrians and the Egyptians and the Greeks and the Romans, they were all polytheists. But this would have also been a radical claim in the history of monotheism, because a lot of scholars of the history of religions 
say that in the early days of monotheism, monotheism wasn't really strict monotheism. It was this notion of, well, there could be other gods that exist. We only know of one who revealed himself, or we're only allowed to worship one god. But again, in some of the Old Testament prophets, they become very explicit of, this is just an ontological fact of reality. There are no other deities outside of the God of Israel. And so what you begin to see in Isaiah chapter 2 is the notion that there's only one God and the notion that people or groups outside of the nation of Israel will eventually be brought into the covenant. These are two concepts that go hand in hand in Isaiah chapter 2. You know, all people, according to that particular verse that I read at the beginning, uh, all people will eventually come to recognize the one true God and accept the law of God. Um, and as an interesting side note, it actually says that all nations, so this includes all the people outside of the Jews, will eventually gather, quote unquote, on the Lord's mountain. Which is interesting because what does that refer to? That refers to Mount Zion which was actually one of the high points in Jerusalem. So therefore, Mount Zion in the Bible is very frequently taken as a symbol for God's heavenly throne. But again, one of the other high points in Jerusalem was the mountain on which King Solomon's temple was built. And again, that was, if you remember from my lecture last week, it was the most important center of worship for ancient Israel. You know, it was the only place where sacrifices were allowed to take place. Um, the high priest, who was the, um, the sort of the chief religious leader on ancient Israel, he walked at the temple. And so, as a result, you know, Mount Zion was very often used as a symbol, not just for the literal historical Mount Zion, but also for the temple mount, the mountain on which the temple was built. For example, you see in the, the second Psalm verse 6, which says, quote, this is God speaking, I myself have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain, unquote. So again, the kings of Israel were very often coronated on, mount, um, on the temple mount, like in the, literally in the doorway leading to the temple. Um, so, uh, or the 132nd Psalm verse 13, which says, quote, yes, the Lord has chosen Zion, desired for his desired it for its dwelling. Unquote. So again, if you remember from last week, the Ark of the Covenant was kept in the temple, and the Ark of the Covenant was seen as the most direct sign of God's presence among his people. So Zion could be a reference to the temple of Jerusalem. Um, and therefore it could be a reference specifically to people taking part in the right worship of God, you know, worship as dictated by God himself as opposed to the, what was considered the false worship of idols. But if you want to interpret the concept, of, and again, this would have been accentuated when the pagans are reported as saying, quote, come, let us go up to the Lord's mountain, to the house of the God of Jacob, uncle. So that right there is language that is very much similar to what you see in pilgrimage. You know, talk about pilgrimages. And remember, there's three times a year in which the Jews were obliged to take pilgrimages to Jerusalem. But again, if you want to take Mount Zion as symbolic for just the more literal, you know, Mount Zion, then the imagery that I had talked about just now goes hand in hand with certain broader symbolism Namely, the symbolism of just growing closer to God more generally. So, again, this verse is symbolic of the fact that when people, you know, put aside their falsehoods and accept the reality of God as he's made himself known to us, they begin to draw nearer to God. And again, it ends that particular verse from Isaiah chapter 2 ends with talk about all of the nations of the world, both Jew and Gentile, destroying their weapons. And again, they take weapons of war and turn it into weapon, into various tools that would have been used for farming. So again, 
things that are associated with destruction now become associated with growth, with life, with building up. And so again, a lot of biblical scholars very frequently interpret this as specifically as a reference to like wars of conquest. So you're not fighting in self-defense. You're, you know, when people when one nation just sort of attacks another nation just because they can, again, that contradicts the very norms of justice, you know, just starting conflict for the sake of conflict. So again, the prophecy ends by talking about as the people of the world start to come closer to the one true God, they begin to really internalize his law. They begin to internalize the true sort of basic principles of justice, which creates a greater sense of, you know, concord and unity and peace among the people. Now, in Christianity, starting relatively early on in the history of Christianity, there was always a strong emphasis on the connection between Jesus fulfilling the messianic expectations more generally and Jesus fulfilling this specific prophecy. You know, so the notion that Jesus fulfills the covenant because he is the Messiah foretold by the covenant and the notion that Jesus brings all people into the covenant, both Jew and Gentile, these two things are connected, even in the Bible itself. Which is why, what's the last thing that Jesus says where, before he ascends into heaven? Well, according to Matthew chapter 28, it's, quote, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you, unquote. So all of this points towards the meaning of this antiphon. So the meaning of this antiphon is that Jesus fulfills the covenant between God and Israel. And in so doing, he opens it up to all people, you know? And the reason why that's significant can actually be seen when you look at the, the last few words of this antiphon. So the last few words of this antiphon are, come and save the human race which you fashioned out of clay. So again, that's also a throwback to the creation story in the book of Genesis, when it talks about God created humans by, again, fashioning the human person out of clay and breathing into it the breath of life. But what does the book of Genesis also say when it says God created the human race? It says God created the human race in his image. And again, what does that mean? Well, to be very brief, the many theologians in the Catholic Church, including people such as St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas, have all asserted that, um, that an image, what makes an image an image is that so let's just say thing A is an image of thing B. Well, if thing A is an image of thing B, that means thing A reflects thing B in such a way that all of the basic qualities of thing B are found in thing A. So to say that humans are images of God in a sort of ontological sense, and again, that's just a fancy term for the philosophical study of being, but that doesn't mean that we're the same type of thing as God, or that God physically looks like us. What that means is that usually in the Catholic tradition, there are three basic things that define the existence of God, that he exists. Not just that he exists, but also that he is a living being. And not just that he's living, but also that he is a personal being, that is, a being with a will and an intellect, a being who has the capacity to know and to choose. Again, closely connected with the capacity to choose is the capacity to love, because love is seen as the desire for some good, and the desire is an act of the will. So to be in the image of God means we have the capacity to know and to love God in a manner similar, though not exactly to the same extent, because of course God is perfect, but in a manner similar to how God knows and loves us. But all of humanity is created in the image of God. And all of humanity suffers from the effects of sin. 
And so therefore, the image of God within all of us has been corrupted and is in need of being restored. So ultimately, you know, there's a distinction. You know, all of humanity was in need of salvation. But God initiated, he prepared his, for his plan of salvation with a specific group of people and through a specific group of people. But what he began among a specific group of people through Jesus was opened up to all people. And so ultimately what you see is this notion that salvation comes from the Jews but is not for them alone. All of humanity is in need of the rest of the restoration that comes through Jesus. And that's why it's important that this antiphon describes Jesus as the, the desire of the nations. Because again, everything comes forth from God and it is perfected only to the extent that it is in a state of union with God. And the highest form of union comes from knowledge and from love. So to the extent that we know God, and to the extent that we are capable of loving God, and being known and loved by God, that there's no higher level of union that a created being can have other than that, you know? And so Jesus, by fulfilling God's plan of salvation, and therefore bringing it to all people, he makes it possible for all people to actualize that desire, which is at the basis of every other desire that we have, the desire to be with God. And so, and the thing is though, you know, humanity, you know, we were in a state of intellectual and moral disorientation, so we needed Jesus to teach us, hence Jesus as divine wisdom. We needed, Jesus teaches us by revealing the law, which is, hence Jesus as Lord give, as lawgiver. We also need to be liberated from our sin in order to actually follow the law, you know, hence both of these things kind of go under Jesus' title of, or his role as Lord. Um, we need Jesus to ultimately shine the divine light onto the human race, hence Jesus' role as the, you know, the light of God, the, the sort of the figurative son. We need Jesus to open up the gates of heaven, hence Jesus' role as the key of David. And so all of these antiphons, that was what was referenced in all of these antiphons, but again, we wouldn't have benefited from any of that if the, if God's plan of salvation had begun and ended just among one specific group of people. So when we talk about Jesus being the Savior and the King, you know, again, His authority extends to all of mankind. And He uses this authority to save all of mankind. Because we are all created in the image of God. And this image, ultimately, in all of us, needs to be restored to the form of glory that it had through the fall. So that's sort of the meaning of that antiphon. Um, are there any questions or comments that you guys have? Again, I know it's relatively straightforward, um, but again, is, if there's something that just popped up that you guys want to explore a little bit more, or? All right, so now, we are actually going to look at the <coughs> second antiphon for tonight. And this is actually the antiphon that, that you know, all Catholics throughout the world who recite Vespers would be celebrate, would be singing tonight. So this is actually the antiphon for this day, for December 23rd, and it's known as the O Emmanuel. So the O Emmanuel in Latin, this is the O Emmanuel in Latin.
So again, like I always say about these specific antiphons, there's something almost eerie about them, and yet at the same time, something very uplifting, something very comforting about them, you know. And again, that's the beauty of the traditional liturgical music of the church. So with the O Emmanuel, the O Emmanuel in English is O Emmanuel, our king and lawgiver, the hope of nations and their savior. Come and save us, O Lord our God. So again, what a way to end the Advent season, you know, by reflecting upon this specific antiphon. And as I said in the beginning, this antiphon is sort of like the culmination of everything that was said in the previous antiphons. Now again, before we can fully appreciate it, we have to step back and we have to ask, why is Jesus called by the title Emmanuel? Now, you all know um, the Christmas song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, which is actually based on this antiphon. And it's, you know, the title of Emmanuel, and, you know, the songs and hymns based on it and chants based on it are repeated throughout, you know, the Christmas season. Um, but the thing is, we have to ask ourselves, what does the title of Emmanuel mean? And again, before we can fully appreciate that, we have to basically look at some context. So the, the name or the title of Emmanuel goes back to the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14. And again, this is one of those verses that everyone here knows, even if you don't know, you know. You know, it's like, again, John chapter 1, John 3, 16, you know. It's, this is just one of those verses. And basically, the historical context is this. So as I've said in previous lectures, the kingdom of Israel eventually at one point divided up into two smaller kingdoms, uh, the, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was also known as the kingdom of Ephraim, the southern kingdom was sometimes known as the kingdom of Judah. So I see some of you shaking your heads, you all know this. Now, I also mentioned a few times the Assyrians. And again, the Assyrians were a major political entity in the ancient Middle East. And so a lot of the prophecies of the Old Testament are a response to the moral and spiritual implications of various political issues that sort of resulted from their ascendancy. As the Assyrians start to expand upon their power, what you eventually see is the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, eventually choosing to become a vassal state of the Assyrians. And the thing is, because they knew that they weren't strong enough to directly take on the Assyrians, but the Northern Kingdom started to form a series of alliances, eventually hoping that by doing so, it could resist the Assyrians. And one of their closest allies was their direct neighbors to the north, the Kingdom of Aram in what is now Syria. So eventually, Ephraim and Aram you know, basically starts to, you know, gain momentum, you know, of like, hey, you know, this is, like, starting to organize plans for, you know, to counteract, you know, a potential Assyrian invasion. And then they start to put pressure on Judah, the southern kingdom, to join in on this alliance. And eventually, Judah said no, you know, they basically declined to join. So eventually, the northern kingdom and the kingdom of Iran, then basically, you know, they then threatened to invade the kingdom of Judah. Now, the thing is, this caused a lot of issues, because, you know, there was God's promise to the people of Israel that he would always protect them, you know? And the thing is, the northern kingdom, they had been the ones who broke away from the kingdom of Israel. So Judah, in many ways, they were the legitimate successors of the kingdom of Israel as it had existed under David and Solomon and Solomon. So as a result, there was, you know, a lot of fear that, you know, if the northern kingdom and the, um, and the Arameans, if they were successful in their defeat, uh, uh, in their invasion of Judah, then this would eventually cause 
you know, Judah to collapse as civilization, and therefore that seemed to bring with it the implication that, you know, God's promise to Judah wouldn't stand. It didn't stand. There was nothing to it. But what eventually happened is in Isaiah chapter 7, God sends the prophet Isaiah to King Ahaz and basically tells him that the combined military forces of Iram and Ephraim are not going to succeed. That basically they're all bark and no bite. It's all going to come to pass. And eventually, you know, you, you know it's, it's all going to go away. And Judah will remain. And no matter what happens politically, it's just going to be another blip on the screen. And more specifically, in verse 14, Isaiah says, quote, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall name him Emmanuel, unquote. Now, the woman in question was the wife of King Ahab. And so obviously the son was whoever was next in line to be the king of Judah. The thing is, we know that King Ahaz's son wasn't actually named Emmanuel. His name was actually historically Hezekiah. So why is he given the name Emmanuel? Well, we know that the name Emmanuel is Hebrew for God with us, or God is with us. And basically, that wasn't so much of an official name as much as it was something that reflected the nature or the, the mission or the spiritual significance of that individual. So the name of, so basically, think about it. If the king and queen were going to give birth to a son, that means that the Davidic line was going to continue for another generation. Which ultimately means that the Syro Ephraimite invasion wasn't going to be successful. Therefore, God's promise to protect his people still stands. And so, therefore, the birth of a child to the queen was actually a sign of God's continuing presence among his people. But it's interesting because in the New Testament, more specifically in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 22 through 23, the, the, the Apostle Matthew applies this prophecy to Jesus himself. And so, and so after describing the story of the conception of Jesus, so, you know, according to Matthew's Gospel, you know, it's Mary and Joseph, they became engaged, but in the period, now well, betrothed, which was a similar though, though distinct concept, but in the period between their betrothal and their marriage, Mary, by the power of the Holy Spirit, <coughs> becomes pregnant with Jesus, and Joseph finds out about this, doesn't know the full story, you know, eventually thinks Mary's cheating, uh, decides to divorce her, but then has a dream in which an angel tells him that Mary became pregnant miraculously and that she would be the mother of the Messiah. And he eventually decides to remain married to Mary and basically be the protector of Mary and of Jesus. But after describing all of that, again, so Matthew 22, 22 to 23, it applies this prophecy to the situation and says, quote, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophets. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Unquote. So, basically, what was symbolically represented in the Old Testament came to pass in the person and mission of Jesus. Basically, Jesus is God in human form, and so therefore he is the definitive sign of God's presence among the human race. And so, and this is actually, you know, again, this helps to explain everything that was said in the previous antiphons. So when we talk about Jesus as the divine wisdom, you know, don't forget what I had said. You know, there's a Trinitarian element to that. You know, God 
turns in on himself and knows himself. You know, the divine mind being omniscient is capable of knowing itself. And so he produces the perfect thought of himself, which, but again, minds and that which are produced by minds are distinct. But again, God being omniscient, he knows himself perfectly. And so God's thought of himself, while distinct from himself, is identical to himself in every single way. So therefore, that which is produced by the divine mind is consubstantial, as it's of one being with the Father. And so, again, Jesus is the definitive expression of the divine wisdom, which makes him of one essence with the Father, you know? And, there, and therefore, when Jesus becomes human, you know, he can attest to the divine wisdom in literally every fiber of his being, and everything he says, and everything he does, it attests to the divine wisdom. Because he is that definitive expression of the divine wisdom, you know? And because he's consubstantial with the Father, the fullness of divine authority rests in him. So again, he can he has he is the only human in whom you could say the absolute authority of God is found. And again, he uses this authority to teach us. He uses this authority to liberate us from sin. And because we can say all of this, we say that the light of divine truth, that the light of divine goodness, that the light of divine wisdom shines upon the human race because of Jesus. And again, because Jesus is both God and human, he serves as a bridge between us and the Father. But again, he could only do that if he was both God and human, not just one or the other. And so, but again, we can say that all of this is the case because Jesus isn't just a human, or Jesus doesn't just remain in his heavenly realm. Jesus, because Jesus is God in the flesh, because Jesus is Emmanuel, we can say that Jesus is all these other things. He is the divine wisdom. He is the Lord. He is the liberator. He is the ultimate teacher. He is the divine light. He's the one who opens the gates of heaven. You know? And again, basically, this is, you can say that this is implicit to every single antiphon. Because to say that God is with us, to say that God becomes one of us, you know, is that leads you to then believing in all these other things. So in a sense, it's almost like reverse engineering, in a sense, because you're beginning with all of these different, not really secondary, but all of these other elements of who Jesus is, and then in the O Emmanuel, in the O God with us, it sort of, you know, says, this is the meaning, this is the capstone of everything that came before. And again, this is the core of the Christmas season. You know, this Christmas we basically celebrate the closeness of God to his creation. You know, that is the source of joy associated with Christmas, you know. And the thing is, with, you know, and it's hard for us because, you know, there are, over time, there are folk traditions that sort of emerge surrounding these major holidays, whether they be religious or secular. And we eventually grow fond of these traditions, and it's like, we should be. But the fact of the matter is, all of these lesser traditions, the meals, the, the parties, the, uh, the family get-togethers, the food, the celebrations, that's meant to give expression to a sense of joy that is inherently spiritual in nature because we're celebrating our salvation. You know what I mean? And so it's, it's also like, why are we having all of these events on Christmas? You know what I mean? And it's because we are celebrating the reality that Christ, as God, enters into the human condition to unite it to itself and by uniting it to itself, he elevates it, he purifies it, and we become participants in that through the reception of grace, which we cooperate with through good works. So through the sacraments, we receive grace, through faith and good works, we accept and cooperate with this grace. And again, but to think that 
God purified and elevated the human condition by uniting it to itself. I mean, I know I've repeated this before, but you have to think about how radical of a claim that is. Because the notion that a God, and especially the way Christians conceive of God as an infinite being, an utterly transcendent being, could stoop down to our level and become like one of us while still remaining God. I mean, that, that, that actually reminds me of, uh, you, I, you all know about the Byzantine tradition. So, you know, this church is of the Latin tradition, which doesn't necessarily mean we always say the Mass in Latin. The Latin tradition refers to the tradition, the liturgical traditions that emerged in the Western, mostly Latin-speaking regions of the Roman Empire, as opposed to the various Eastern traditions. Um, and one of them is the Byzantine tradition, which um, evolved mostly in Greece and Turkey, you know, the area mostly surrounding Constantinople, which is really the, the political center of it all. But in the Byzantine tradition, I believe, I, I know it's in one of the liturgies of the hours associated with, uh, with Christmas Day itself, I forgot which one exactly, but they actually have a chance that they sing on one of the liturgy of the hours of Christmas itself, and it says, quote, Today is born of a virgin, he who holds the whole of creation in his hand. He whose essence none can touch is bound in swaddling clothes as a child. He who established the heavens in the beginning lies in a manger. So think, of, think about that. Just like let that sink in for a couple of minutes. And that is ultimately what we are celebrating in Christmas. That reality. You know? And in the rest of the liturgical year leading up to Easter, ultimately what we see is this reality, is the flip side of this same reality. You know, Jesus dying and then rising from the dead. But again, it's two different parts, two different ends of the same spectrum. It's two different sides of the same coin, of the same reality. The notion of God lowering <coughs> himself down to our level to elevate us to be closer to him. And so, because of this is the reality of what Christmas is all about, we as Catholics can pray, can sing with boldness, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom your captive people who dwell in the lowly exile of sin here upon earth. Shine thy light upon us, calling us to yourself, and drive away the gloominess of spiritual darkness. Save us from the depths of hell and from the tyranny of evil through your liberative power." Unquote. And we can turn to our fellow Christians and say, quote, Rejoice, rejoice. For Emmanuel will come to thee, unquote. And that is the core of the Christmas sphere. So with that in mind, I'd like to thank you all for coming out. And you've been a wonderful crowd. So again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So again, if there's any other questions, comments, uh, points of clarification, uh, you can let me know. Uh, you know I'm opening the floor up to questions. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your knowledge on our Oh, thank you. Well, I mean, a lot of it is basically, a lot of it is rooted in, in the Bible. I think that's what a lot of people don't know, don't fully appreciate, is the fact that, you know, so much of the Catholic Mass is rooted in very explicit biblical you know, scholarship. You just got to take a half a step back and you begin to see the context. And again, it all connects. The more you look at it, the more you see these connections. So, again, it's, it's wonderful. It's just, and once you go down this rabbit hole, you can't stop, you know? <laughs> but, again, like I said, it's in, in a good way, you know? But again, the more you look at this stuff, as I said a few weeks ago, the more you look at this stuff, the more it lights a fire underneath you, the more you get excited about it, you know? It's like, because once you begin to see the deeper meaning of what we do as Catholics, it really it just motivates you to want to grow closer to God. And, you know, so it's just, it's, it's wonderful. It's beautiful, you know. So again, thank you all for coming out. And, thank you.
Uh, I hope you all really benefited from this, and I hope yes. you can, you know, as the Christmas, because Christmas ain't done yet. Even though it's two days till Christmas, yeah. technically Advent is done. Yeah. You still got another 12 days, or like two weeks yeah. or so of Christmas. Mm -hmm. So hopefully you still have more time to reflect upon this, and hopefully, you know, a lot of the symbols that we talked about the last, you know, three, four weeks are going to continue in the next, you know, half a month. So I hope you, this helps you to really notice some things in Christmas and, you know, I hope it, you know, really, you know, it's like, oh, now I understand that and that and that. So, you know, again, thank you very much. And again, it's been just as much of a pleasure for me being here with you guys. So that's the opposite. So thank you. Thank you.